Um, my name is Kate Suits. I'm the Marianne McLean educator at the Illinois State Museum. Thank you all for joining us for Cradle to Grave, Ages and Stages of 1800s Women's Clothing. So without further ado, I would like to turn things over to the ISM history curator, Erica Holst. Um, thank you so much for everyone attending this program. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. And away we go. We are talking about from cradle to grave, ages and stages of 19th century women's clothing. And this talk um, is based on work done for the Illinois State Museum's Fashioning Illinois 1820 to 1900 exhibit. And this is currently on view at the Illinois State Museum's Lockport facility. Um, it's ongoing until March 31st of next year. So if you happen to be in the suburban Chicago area, um, please go check it out. Um, all of the clothing that you'll see in tonight's presentation are from the Illinois State Museum's collection and many of them are actually on view in this exhibit. So we're going to be talking about ages and stages of women's clothing. That is what different types of clothing a woman might be wearing at different stages in her life. And we're going to go through this um, fairly chronologically and that's a consistent and logical way to organize. But as we go through this, um, keep in mind that women's actual experiences varied based on so many factors. Um, your experience would be different whether you were middle class or working class whether you were black or white, whether you were native born or an immigrant, whether you lived in the country or in the city. Also, um, some of the different roles that women took on in their lives, such as um, bride or wife or widow, these could fluctuate as well. You might be a bride and a mother and a widow and a bride again and have to go back to work. So everything's very dynamic, um, but we're gonna just kind of go through a broad overview of the types of garments that women might have been wearing in the 19th century. So we're going to start with infancy and toddlerhood. And so for um, infant girls, as for any infant, um, this is a very precarious time of life because child mortality is quite high in the 19th century. Um, in fact, about a third of children did not live to see their um, um, fifth birthdays. And it's important when we talk about uh, life expectancy and child mortality to make the distinction between lifespans and life expectancies. Um, sometimes they get confused. And we hear that people in the 19th century might have had a life expectancy of 40 years. That doesn't mean that they were old at 35. What it means is if you have two children and one child um, dies before his first birthday and the other child lives to 80, you have an average life expectancy of 40 years there. In reality, once children hit certain milestones in their life, they might sort of expect to live longer. So the first year was perilous, up until five was perilous. But a 19th century girl who made it to age five um, could reasonably expect to live to uh, 70 years old. This increased again once um, a child hits the age of 21. And then for a woman, if a woman successfully lived through her childbearing years, um, she could reasonably expect to live into her 70s or 80s. Um, so there's no such thing as like a, you know, 30 year old ancient lifespan in the 19th century. So with children, um, we're looking at an infant gown and a toddler dress. Small children in the 19th century were dressed alike, whether they were boys and girls. Um, gender distinctions were fairly immaterial. People didn't care um, if the child was a boy or a girl. It mattered more that small children were um, visually distinct from older children and adults. And so the baby dress is kind of a look. And that baby dress that's long is for a pre-mobile infant. So an infant up to about, say, six to nine months. People often confuse these with christening gowns because they're long dresses, but this is just sort of standard baby wear. In the summer, this gown would be of muslin or linen. In the winter, it would be of wool flannel. The bottom would be tucked around the baby's little feet to keep it warm. Um, the top was often fastened with a drawstring so there wouldn't have to be any hooks or buttons. 
And then once a child became mobile, um, starting around six months, maybe nine to 12 months, they were put into short clothes and this allowed their little legs to move and allowed them to kind of master the, um, the art of walking. And so throughout this presentation, I'm going to couple examples of 19th century clothing from our exhibit um, and from our collections. And I'm gonna pair them with 19th century photos of actual um, women and children. And except in a couple of cases, it's not the actual people who owned the clothes. Um, these are just people who are wearing clothes that are similar. And it's meant to give you an idea that, you know, the garments aren't static, they were, they were belong to living people who lived and got them dirty and cleaned them and, and lived their lives in them. Um, you'll notice that baby clothes are white and this is by design. Today, it's probably the least practical thing you can do is dress a um, child in white. Um, in the 19th century, it was the most practical thing you could do because white was actually the easiest fabric to wash. On wash day, the white garments were um, soaked and then they were boiled in scalding water, and then they were scrubbed vigorously with lye soap. And garments that had dyes in them um, wouldn't stand up to that kind of treatment. They would start to fade immediately. Um, white garments did, and especially linen holds up to washing beautifully. It actually gets softer the more you wash it. Okay, so after a girl survived infancy, she was on to her girlhood, um, say from about the time she was maybe um, two to three years old um, until let's say about 10 to 12 is what we're looking at here. And at this point, little girls are dressed in clothes that are kind of pint-sized versions of their mother's clothes. There are some important differences. Small girls wore skirts that were about knee length. Um, they would gradually lengthen until they hit about age 14 or 16. And in the 1840s and 50s, they would be wearing pantalets under for modesty's sake. Um, but girls at this time, again, were, were treated like little miniature adults to some degree. Um, they were starting to learn the roles that society expected of them. So within their households, um, they would have a needle put into their hand at about age four or five, and they would be taught to sew. Um, they would be taught to help their mother with simple household tasks. That girl there is carrying a doll. A doll is kind of the iconic little girl plaything. Um, it's also a training tool. A doll lets a girl practice sewing clothes for it. Um, it teaches a girl how to be mothering and nurturing. So these gender roles start and there were um, definitely messages that were imparted to girls via popular culture. And I'm just gonna read some advice that comes out of 1850s domestic advice manuals to girls. There's really nothing more important to the happiness than early learning to yield your will to that of others. The happiness of your parents and your home depend much upon your conduct. Never raise your voice. And she goes on, the author of this advice manual goes to list the do's and don'ts in there. Don't raise your voice. Don't speak until spoken to. Be prompt. Be tidy. Don't be talkative. Don't be rude. Don't be lazy. Don't be in ill humor. Never carry with you a glum look. It looks selfish and cold and throws a damp upon the whole circle. And so there are these messages um, drilled into girls from a young age in the 19th century. And some of them seem kind of familiar today. Um, these things take root and they're things that women, I would argue, live with today. The idea that um, you need to sacrifice your happiness to others, that um, harmony depends on you being cheerful and pleasant and kind of swallowing down any feelings that you might have otherwise. Starts young. So by the time a girl moves into her tweens, um, she's definitely dressing like a miniature version of her mother. The only difference is now that her skirts are about mid-calf. Um, tween girls are um, now regular contributors to the household. Um, if this is a middle class household, they are sewing and helping to mend and helping to tidy or mind younger siblings. If this is a working class household, um, they might be going off to a factory. They might be going out to domestic servants. Um, girls enter domestic service as young as 12 and 13 years old sometimes. Um, if it's a rural family, she's definitely helping out around the home or around the farm. She's caring for the chickens. She's helping her mother with dairying and again with the sewing and cooking duties. 
And so the tweens um, are also a period of comparative freedom for girls. Although she's being trained into her role um, as a woman, there are still some freedoms. There's still some permissiveness to kind of run around. And you see this girl with her hair down. Um, she's not quite assumed the role of a woman who's out in society and looking for a husband. And there's this quote below by Frances Willard on her 18th birthday that I think just beautifully illustrates this time when um, the freedom of childhood ends and your time as an adult woman begins. And she says, this is my birthday and the date of my martyrdom. Mother insists that I at last must have my hair done up woman fashion. My back hair is twisted up like a corkscrew. I carry 18 hairpins. My head aches miserably. My feet are entangled in the skirt of my hateful new gown. I can never jump over a fence again so long as I live. So that's what being a woman was like. Um, so by 18, it's actually quite late to um, be kind of assuming that role of full-fledged womanhood. Um, most girls entered it somewhere in the vicinity of 14, 15, 16. And when you're a young woman, um, you enter a period of relative freedom that is um, Let's see, it's pretty brief and fleeting and might not be experienced again until perhaps um, you're a widow later in life. But there's this golden moment. Um, if you are a middle class girl, your job now is to essentially make yourself attractive to a young man and find your life partner. If you're living at home and your mother is still living, then she's the principal housekeeper. So although you're helping around the house, your mother is the one who's managing the household, who's managing the cooking, the cleaning. Um, you're just a helper, you don't bear that responsibility. Um, so a woman also at this time, um, this is when you can indulge yourself in fashion. So if you've seen those images of women tight lacing their corsets to ridiculous sizes, you're probably going to do it as a teenager or a young single woman. This is the time when you can get away with bright colors that on an older woman would be considered gaudy. It's when you can get away with accessories and ornamentation and being trendy and being done up to the nines. Um, and one of the domestic advice manuals says there's a certain gaiety and brightness of a Attire is as suitable for youth as sober colors and quiet styles are for more advanced life. If you are a working class woman, um, sometimes you are off to work now, and this might be for a variety of reasons. You might be in a household where your income is needed to contribute to the financial well being of the whole. You might be a um, girl who lives on a farm family and you intend to get married, but for a couple of years while you're young, you're going to go into domestic service or be a helper on another farm to earn money. Um, maybe it's to buy yourself some nice clothes. Maybe it's to put a brother through college. Um, there's a brief period of economic independence where a lot of women um, go out and earn money. Um, some of them settle down to be married. Some of them continue uh, contributing to the family's household income as married women. And some of them, um, especially in working class families, some women are sort of designated to remain single. Um, in a working class family where the economic survival of the whole depends on every member contributing, it wasn't uncommon for some daughters to be the designated caretakers, the ones who would take care of their siblings um, until they were grown and then their parents in their old age because the well-being of the whole uh, superseded individual desires. And then most young women um, of the 19th century tended to marry around age 20 to 22 years old. And in the 19th century, we have this ideal of what's called a companionate marriage. And that's a marriage based more on affection rather than economic interest. During the 1600s, 1700s, um, marriage really was more of an economic transaction. Um, a, woman got a place to live and financial support in exchange for her household work. If they happen to live on neighboring farms, then they could consolidate their land. The 19th century sees the romantic ideal of choosing a spouse for compatibility and that marriage is meant to be an emotionally fulfilling union in addition to a um, convenient economic union. 
Uh, women are also given more agency in their selection of a partner. Prior to this, um, marriages could be essentially all but arranged but families for, by families. By the 19th century, um, women are courting and they're getting to know gentlemen and they can make the choice to marry. And this is the single most important choice that a woman will make in her life um, because she still is going to be dependent on her husband in a lot of ways. Um, legally, uh, her identity almost ceases to exist when she gets married um, in a legal term called femme covert. It means that um, her husband is the one who would need to negotiate contracts or um, participate in lawsuits and manage the money. Um, it wasn't until later in the 19th century that a married woman was allowed to keep any money that she brought into the marriage. So marrying well um, not only meant marrying someone who could provide for you, but marrying someone who could be kind to you and respectful of you. Um, marrying someone who was abusive or um, who had problems with alcohol would kind of doom a woman to um, an unhappy life in an era where divorce was much less common than it is today, although it's starting to become more common. So with brides, you have, um, you have these garments here, and oh, I think I skipped talking about the previous two garments. I'm sorry, I've got to focus on both. So in the 19th century, um, some brides wore white, um, not all brides. Queen Victoria made popular the convention of wearing white to weddings, um, but white is a very expensive color. It's difficult to attain and it's definitely difficult to achieve. So um, white was more a symbol of a bride's affluence than her purity in the 19th century. Um, certainly some women did wear it, like the woman in the picture. Orange blossoms, which um, symbolized fertility and beauty were also incorporated into bridal costumes a lot. However, many women were married in what was considered a best dress and the dress that's pictured and the photo next to it, that's actually the photo of the woman who wore the dress. So that's the real life dress in that photo. Her name was Mary Elizabeth Kiesler and she married Henry Warner in 1897. They were um, the children of German immigrants and they were farmers in Mason City, Illinois. And so wearing a um, best dress was really a very practical choice because um, garments were labor intensive and they were expensive. And so by investing in a garment that you could continue to wear after your wedding, you had one more garment that would be suitable for future nice occasions. And women tended to alter them. Um, it wasn't sort of a one and done like a modern wedding dress is. Um, a wedding dress would be altered to keep keep time with the fashions and stay current um, over time. And now we have the life of a young married woman. And in 1840, when she was a single woman, a young Mary Todd asked a girlfriend, why is it that married folks always become so serious? And it was um, definitely sort of a reality check that 19th century women experienced when they went from the idealization of this romantic love, which was really played up in popular culture with love stories and romantic songs, to the realities of running your own household. And even though you, your mother was supposed to have trained you from a young age, there was nothing like getting thrown in the deep end and being the person who is responsible for getting food on the table, responsible for keeping the house clean, responsible for raising children, for um, making your husband shirts and making sure they're ironed and he's ready to go. It's a whole lot of work that falls onto women. And so um, it's well documented that women would kind of experience this sort of like emotional crash after they got married and found themselves in this new life. They're separated physically. They're no longer in the household of their support system and their family. And they've got a whole lot of work to do. One domestic advice manual put it like this. It said, a really good housekeeper is almost always unhappy. While she does so much for the comfort of others, she nearly ruins her own health and life. It is because she cannot be easy and comfortable when there is the least disorder or dirt to be seen. So that's the ideal to live up to there. Um, and again, this uh, varied based on where exactly a woman was, um, but no woman really had a life of leisure. Um, 
About a third of American families employed domestic servants at this time. Um, they, domestic servants were a help in the house. They were not a replacement for labor. Often um, a housewife would work alongside her servant. Um, most women are doing some pretty um, heavy lifting and hard work um, just generally. And this increases if you are a rural woman or um, a working class woman on a farm, um, in addition to cleaning and child rearing and cooking, you would also be responsible for livestock, for dairying, for the garden, for keeping track of poultry, and you might even be uh, weaving cloth and making clothes. In fact, the garment that we have um, on view here was made by a woman named Susan Watson of Jackson County around the year 1860. And she raised the sheep that provided the cotton that she later spun into yarn and then wove with um, weft of wool to create this linsey woolsey fabric. She dyed it herself and she made the garment herself. If you are a um, working class woman, um, oftentimes your labor is needed to contribute to the health of the household. And so you might be taking in borders, which are extra mouths to feed and extra bedrooms to clean. Or you might be taking in sewing and mending to do in your spare time or taking in laundry. And then of course comes um, pregnancy, which was, um, sort of an expected condition of life and um, often a constant condition of life in the 19th century. Um, granted, birth rates were declining um, in around the year 1800. Um, a woman might expect to have about eight children and be pregnant almost every other year from about 22 to 42 when she might have her last child. Um, by the mid 19th century, women could expect to deliver about five to six children. Um, there's the threat of maternal mortality, which lingers over the process of giving birth. Almost all women would have known someone who died during childbirth, whether it was their own mother, whether it was a sister or a friend. Um, one in 100 births resulted in the death of the mother. And ironically, what's going on in the 19th century is this is when you get uh, the medicalization of childbirth, when midwives are ceding ground to um, professional male doctors. And this is before germ theory. So you have these doctors who are kind of poking around as a woman's giving birth and perhaps using their instruments, and they're not washing their hands. So there's a lot of bacteria being transferred in what was called childbed fever, these bacterial infections that would take hold and prove fatal after a woman delivered. In terms of um, how being pregnant curtailed a woman's activities, I was sort of under the um, illusion that women went inside and locked the door and hid the second they became pregnant and didn't come out until they had a six month old baby did some research and found out that it wasn't quite like that. In fact, um, pregnant women were actually out and about more than I expected. Um, there's a set of letters from a woman who delivered a, a baby in the 1850s that I watched pretty closely. And it seems like she was still going to church about six weeks out from delivery. She was still um, having people visit her in her home. And she really kind of disappeared behind closed doors about three weeks out from delivery. Um, she took a long time to recover, and then she was back to back in the swing of her normal social life um, by about five months afterwards. In terms of clothing, um, there's no such thing as maternity clothing in the 19th century. Um, there's no such thing as ready-made clothing at all for women until the end of the century. But um, pregnancy was a condition that came and went, and so women's clothes were altered accordingly. You would take an existing garment and you would um, let out the seams, or maybe you'd add extra fabric, or you'd add a drawstring to it. Um, when you were no longer pregnant, after you delivered your child, you would alter the clothes back to fit your new figure, which might be a little bit thicker than it was pre-pregnancy. Um, and then, so the clothing was in a constant state of flux. And this is why maternity clothing is rather rare in museum collections, because most of it um, eventually at the end of its life has been altered back to just um, standard women's wear. It's no longer maternity clothing. It's been taken back in. The Illinois State Museum has two garments in its collection um, that are maternity wear. And sadly, both of the women who wore them died in childbirth. And my suspicion is 
is that's why these garments survived because the woman didn't survive to alter the clothing and continue to wear it. And then after pregnancy, of course, comes child rearing. Um, and again, this is something that a woman could expect to experience um, on average of five to six times um, in her life. She could expect to lose children. Um, that was kind of the rule, not the exception. And today we have come a long way in terms of um, medicine and antibiotics and vaccines. And so the infectious diseases that claim the lives of so many small children in the 19th century are um, sort of in our rear view mirror, although living in pandemic times kind of brings that all rushing back. Um, in the 19th century, um, it was sort of something that you expected to go through. In fact, the woman in this photo here um, has lost her child. And I selected this photo to go with the dress because it's this wonderful example. She's wearing what's known as a morning dress or a wrapper. Um, morning is in like AM, not morning. Um, it's this loose. Um, it's not very fitted at the top. And you can see her skirt is open. She's showing her petticoat on her lap. And she's got this tiny, tiny little baby on her lap. And so what's probably happened is this, this baby has died at a very young age. And the photographer um, might have come to her home to record the baby's image um, before its funeral. And the mother, for physical reasons or emotional reasons, is not in a place where she's gotten herself dressed for this photograph. She's still in very intimate apparel that she would be wearing in her house. And then to the left, we have this garment that's an example of the morning dress or wrapper. Um, and oftentimes these are made from a nicer dress that you might sort of cut apart and add some trim and um, turn into this morning wear. And again, this is something that's meant for, um, it's meant for your bedroom, it's meant for your home when you have no company, it's not something that you're gonna go visiting in or have people over in. Um, oftentimes they're fastened loosely with big buttons or a drawstring. And so this makes it easy for um, access for nursing. Um, and just to give you a sense of what it took to raise children in the 19th century, um, there's a woman named Mary Stewart in Springfield, and I'm going to quote from a letter that she wrote to her almost grown daughter in 1856. This is after she's delivered her um, either her sixth or seventh child. I think it's her seventh child. And she says, um, I'm afraid now it'll be too late for the mail, but I will try and finish with baby on my lap. How I do wish the colicky time was over. The ladies just now are having a good many little strawberry gatherings, which are very pleasant, but as usual, I am prevented from participating because she's got about a six week old at that point. She says, when my children grow up, I hope to have great comfort in them, for I certainly have been a slave to their interests the best part of my life, which I think is just the historian, it's kind of awesome that she laid it out there because there's the ideal in the 19th century um, of these, you know, loving, pious, angelic mothers who are devoted to their ch children and, and to their homes. And then Mary kind of lays out the reality, like she's had to put a whole lot of her own interests on hold for the sake of her children. And she kind of resents it. She wants to be at one of those strawberry parties, but, you know, alas, there she is. And so this is sort of an odd fit here because we're going from child rearing, um, but I wanted to stress the point that um, women, regardless of their um, age, as long as they're in physical health, and especially towards the end of the 19th century, are a lot more active than sometimes we think. Um, kind of pre-Civil War, the ideal of womanhood was this, like, it was this sort of frail flower and she was housebound and devoted to her house. More and more after the Civil War, the ideal of womanhood was replaced by this idea of this robust, active, vigorous woman. Um, the clothing changed to reflect sort of this like active physique and women were encouraged to do things like go on picnics and go hiking and do archery and play croquet and go to the seaside and especially to ride the bicycle and the bicycle came in in the later part of the 19th century and this was a huge liberating force for women um, picture women who could never really go anywhere faster than the speed of their own feet or in a carriage usually in the company of someone else 
being able to ride fast down the street wherever she wanted to go completely independently. In fact, Susan B. Anthony said, let me tell you what I think of bicycling. I think it has done more to emancipate women than anything else in the world. And so um, women's fashions um, became a little bit more emancipated at the time too. You see the rise of these bicycling costumes and that's what you're looking at on the left there. And this actually has a false front of a skirt. If you lift up that buttoned flap, you'll see that it's actually a split skirt. So it's basically like a huge pair of culottes with a flap in front. And this is to make it easier to pedal so skirts don't get caught up in the wheels. You also at this time um, even see some women wearing lady bloomers out to ride because clothing was bowing to this need that women had to um, have more ease of mo movement and freedom to be athletic and active. Now we have the matron and I bring up the matron because um, this is our standard, let's say she's a middle-aged woman, she's in her 30s to 40s to 50s, her children are older, um, if not grown altogether, so she's not a young bride or a young mother, she's established in society, and boy do the etiquette manuals have opinions of what the matron should wear. They are unequivocal that matron should not be in gaudy colors and matron should not be in trendy clothes. Um, they say things like ladies of mature years and settled position were, will dress according to their pos position and are allowed a more expensive and rich style than is appropriate for the very young. At the same time, their fancy must be allowed less play and above all, any eccentricities such as may be forgiven to a dashing girl must be avoided by a matron. They must dress exactly as propriety requires if they were to avoid censure. So basically that means um, no loud colors. Um, older women were encouraged to wear heavy silks, um, velvet, um, and exude a quiet elegance. One of the perks of being an older woman was that um, jewelry was considered more permissible on older women than it was on younger women. Young girls and teenagers were supposed to be ornamented by their youthful glow alone, but by the time you're an older woman, you could bust out the accessories and pile it on, and that was considered okay. So at this point in a woman's life, um, if she is juggling all the societal expectations, she is managing a household, keeping her family fed, keeping her house well decorated, um, being an attractive hostess to company, raising solid citizens and um, good people to go out into the world. She's a help me to her husband. She's attending church. She's helping out with a charity um, and doing it all with a cheerful, modest, you know, quiet elegance. So it was a tall order, um, the degree to which any one woman lived up to it um, was based on temperament, was based on where they were born in life, um, was based on the demands on them and what they needed to contribute financially. Um, you know, maybe a woman is taking in sewing or borders or washing to keep her family afloat. Um, but the pressure is there. There's a societal pressure for women to accomplish certain tasks and to um, display a certain demeanor. So I put widow towards the end of a woman's life cycle here um, because we're being home, we're being optimistic and hoping that her husband has lived to a nice ripe old age, but that the wife has outlived him. Um, and so widowhood is a it's another transitional time in a woman's life. And it sort of depends on how her marriage went and how well her husband has provided for her. Um, if her husband has provided well for her, um, she might live comfortably for the rest of her life and experience sort of a degree of freedom that she didn't have before. She's no longer a femme cover. She's got her legal identity back. Um, she can conduct business, she can own property, she can manage her money. There's a woman in Springfield whose name is Henrietta Ulrich, who did that after her husband died. Um, she went into the lumber business, she made a ton of money, she was a strong businesswoman in town. 
Widows at that time were entitled to what were called dower rights, which is essentially about a third of her husband's estate. And often the house that they were living in would pass to a child, but the wife had the right to live there for the rest of her life. If um, her husband or the family was in precarious financial situation, then widowhood could be a darn scary time for a woman. Um, she might have to be thrown on her own devices for support. Um, if she had young children, this would be extra challenging because now she might be required to provide for those children. And so oftentimes you see widows who um, are taking in sewing and things like taking in sewing and laundry and borders are especially well suited to women because those are jobs that can be done at home. They don't pay well, um, they are physically strenuous, they require long hours, but at least you can do them at home so you can be present and be minding your children. In terms of what mourning looks like in the 19th century for a woman, um, there's a distinct culture of mourning. And so mourning and grieving are related, but not necessarily synonymous. Um, grieving is sort of the private act of um, coming to terms with the loss. Mourning has more of a public kind of connotation to it. And mourning was definitely a thing in the 19th century. The degree to which a woman followed mourning customs of etiquette depended on her personal inclination, depended on how close she was to the deceased, depended on her financial ability and other pressures on her. But if she, let's say, were a well-off woman who really wanted to get into the mourning thing, um, a widow was advised to, um, in the most extreme cases, be in first stage or deepest mourning for her husband for a year. And first stage mourning means um, plain black fabrics. Um, oftentimes they wore crepe or bombazine, which are not shiny. They're like light sucking and life sucking fabrics. No jewelry, black collars and cuffs, um, often a veil over their face. Um, they are shielded and for better or worse. Um, in one case, this gives a woman space to grieve and it provides a barrier to the outside world. Her mourning is literally a physical barrier that keeps people from engaging too closely and gives her the space to process her feelings. On the other hand, if she's not that sad, then um, it's sort of a limitation to her ability to engage in life. The second year is spent in what's called um, second stage mourning. And at this point, women are still in black. Um, they might add white collars, white cuffs, um, add some shinier jewelry to the mix. The uh, dress that we see pictured here is probably an example of second stage mourning because there's all these lovely jet beads hanging from them and she paired them with white cuffs. And then another six months after that is spent in half mourning. And this is a woman's gradual transition back into society. She might be wearing gray or mauve, sort of subdued colors where she's introducing color back into her life, but slowly. And at the end of that, which is now two and a half years later, then it's considered time for her to perhaps marry again and, and resume her place in the world. If you're wondering about men's mourning customs, they are not that intense. Um, the presumption is that a man who is left without a wife, especially if he has small children at home, um, needs to go out and provide for his family right away, and he needs to get married again right away. So a man might express his mourning by wearing a band around his arm or a band around his hat, and he will do that for about three to six months, and then his mourning is over and he is back in the game. And so finally, um, oh, no, I'm sorry, we've got um, the clothes of an older woman here. And so once a woman has reached her golden age, um, she is, she's, has some expectations like the matron. Um, she's not expected to dress too young for her age. She's not expected to dress in um, trendy hairstyles or in bright colors or in low cut um, or short sleeved garments. Um, and another etiquette book says, 
Neither will an elderly lady attire herself in gaudy colors, nor wear a profusion of ornaments, nor affect abimant, which become young people. To do so in advanced years were, will militate against the respect and deference which it demands and assuredly subject the ancient to contempt and ridicule. So if you didn't want to invite contempt and ridicule, they would dress kind of mature, modern, or I mean um, subdued um, conservatively. However, once you've reached old age, um, some women had the option of foregoing their corset. Um, if you decided you've been in your corset long enough and it's not comfortable, maybe you've put on some weight in your old age, now is the time when it's socially acceptable to let that go. You can see the woman in the photo who is uh, Lucy McWhorter. She's the wife of Free Frank McWhorter from Pike County, um, is wearing this sort of loose fitting bodice here. Um, day caps are also uh, kind of common wear for older women, and Lucy is wearing a day cap here. Um, a day cap is a get out of jail free card for doing your hair. It is, um, you don't have to do an elaborate hairstyle, you just kind of put on a day cap and call it a day. And so the garment we're seeing is actually a reproduction of the garment that Lucy is wearing in this photo. Um, we had a wonderfully talented seamstress named Mary Helen Yoakum who created this dress uh, so it could go on display in the Fashioning Illinois exhibit. And so the last stage that we're going to talk about um, are the clothes that um, women wear after death. Um, I do show a postmortem photo in the next slide, so I'm giving you a warning here if that's not something you want to see. Um, you probably want to close your eyes and look away at this time, and I'll tell you when it's done. So um, part of the Victorian way of death it's having a proper goodbye. And this starts prior to death. Um, deathbed scenes were important. If you could gather around the bed of a dying relative and say your final goodbyes, and that person could assure you that they were at peace, that they'd made peace with their creator, and they were ready to go on to the next stage of life, um, that was considered the best that you could hope for. After that, uh, having people come to say goodbye to the person um, as a funeral was part of that grieving process. If you couldn't actually be present at the physical moment of death, getting a chance to see the body and say your goodbyes after death was part of that process of attaining closure. These funerals had to happen pretty quickly. Um, before the Civil War, there wasn't any such thing as embalming. And so um, generally a person would be buried about the day after they died. And funerals um, before the Civil War typically took place at home. And so the after death care fell to the person's relatives. Um, the family members would be the ones to wash and dress the body. And the clothing for after death um, might be the deceased own clothing and it was common to either dress the deceased in night clothes and this symbolized the idea of death as a prolonged sleep or they might dress the um, deceased in clothes from their life particularly traveling clothes which sort of signified death as a journey that they were embarking on However, people also wore what were called burial shrouds. And a shroud is essentially a garment that um, sort of mimics a regular day dress, except it's often open at the back and in very loose sleeves and it's sort of easier to put on. Pardon me. <coughs> And so after the Civil War, as you have um, techniques like embalming, you also have funeral parlors and professional funeral directors and morticians. And the business of death gradually gets moved out of the home to a funeral parlor. So it's not the home parlor, now it's the funeral parlor. And a professional is handling the tasks of washing and dressing the body. So at this point, you have these ready-made burial garments available on the market, and that's what you're looking at in that photo to the left. These are mass-produced. Um, the garment is meant to look lovely from about the chest up, or what you would see in a half-open casket. Beyond that, um, very rough, you know, not finished well, kind of rough edges and um, sort of uh, fast, quick basting seams. And so again, this is um, uh, a symbol of the way that 
death became almost commercialized. It's death care is a service that you purchase. Burial clothes are commodities that you purchase. And so um, this brings us to the end of our talk, which is good because my voice is starting to give out. So um, I'm going to move away from the postmortem photo. If uh, you want to open your eyes again, if you didn't want to see it. Now is the time for questions or discussions. Um, I do want to give a quick plug before we do that. If you are interested in um, having photos of these lovely dresses of your very own to look through. We do have a lookbook for sale in the um, Illinois State Museum shop, which is online at this point, although um, in November we will be opening the physical shop. But if you want to order one, um, visit shop at IllinoisStateMuseum.org and you can get this beautiful full color lookbook of the Fashioning Illinois exhibit for $4.99 or you can get a Fashioning Illinois mask with a pattern that was inspired by one of the garments in the show for $9.99. Okay, so we'll go back. Um, time for questions or comments. Okay, so Erica, you've got one question relating back to baby gowns and laundry issues at the time. Why such long baby gowns with laundry issues at the time? Why such long baby gowns? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so like very young children, like baby babies were swaddled and then the long gowns is sort of like swaddling light. Like you take the long part of the skirt and um, fold it up under a baby's feet to keep it warm. Beyond that, I don't know if there's any other advantage, um, but that's that's what I've read about it. Great, thank you. Um, another one, what about morning jewelry? Oh, morning jewelry is awesome. So jet, um, like the beads hanging off that dress is very popular because it's black also um, onyx and obsidian. Um, often it's hair jewelry and hair jewelry could be collected from the deceased and you could actually take it to a jewelry store and dump it on the counter and they would weave it into earrings or a brooch or set it into a ring for you. However, um, hair jewelry wasn't necessarily just for um, dead people. It was also to commemorate ties and bonds of affection with people in your life who were living. So um, a husband might wear a watch chain made of his wife's hair, or a wife might wear a ring with her husband's hair in it, and both of them were alive. They were just really into each other. Okay, thank you, Erica. Who is Frances Willard and was she famous? She was. She was a famous um, suffragette and I believe that she was the leader of the Women's Christian Temperance Movement. And she was from Illinois. Her house is a museum up in the Chicago area. Great, thank you. Um, if anyone else has questions, please post them in the question and answer. Um, I will try and go back and get some from the chat. I know there were a few back there. Um, what is, um, what do you think of women conceiving later these days, um, 35 to 40? And then another one that also goes with that is, um, how would that have been viewed during the 19th century? Um, it would have been common, actually, um, and it's funny because uh, I look back and both of my grandmothers delivered children at 42, and then I went back since I live in Springfield and my original field of interest was kind of the social life of um, 19th century Springfield, I was looking at women and their families, um, most of them stopped giving birth in the in their early 40s. So really, um, menopause is the end of a woman's childbearing year, years, and they might be giving birth right up until that. So it would kind of be, you know, par for the course. Um, if you were 42, then you would have had like five children preceding, you know, your, your later in life baby, but um, it was actually quite common. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century that women really start to limit their family size. They are um, having fewer children. By the year 1900, they're maybe having like three or four children. 
spaced closer together and then they're stopping and you know then by 35 or 40 they're done and on to the next phase of life but prior to that it's you know you keep giving birth until your body physically won't do it anymore thank you and the next one could we please get the title for the domestic manual that rep uh, refer to the good housekeeping keepers being unhappy. Yes, let me go back to where that was. Um, I think it's, I'm sorry, it was actually a magazine and it's a magazine called The Household and it's the January 1884 issue. Thank you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about women's underwear? Yes, in fact, I've got an entire um, program about it, which is on the Illinois State Museum's YouTube channel. So if you want um, an in-depth discussion, go check it out. But briefly, um, there's many, many layers going on underneath. You start with a chemise, and a chemise is basically like a short night dress. You wear that closest to your body to absorb the sweat and oils. Your clothes, your outer dress, um, unless it's like a cotton calico work dress, is not something you're going to throw in a wash bucket and scrub. You're going to try to wear these layers that are going to protect your outer garment from all your sweat and stuff inside. So the layers, in order of putting them on, typically wear a chemise pair of pantalets, um, also known as drawers. Um, then you would put on, let me think, um, sometimes socks and shoes um, before you put on your corset, um, then your corset, then an under petticoat for modesty in case your skirt's tipped up. Um, then you would put on um, more petticoats or a cage crinoline if it's the 1860s, an over petticoat over that, um, and then then I think you're ready for your garment. So lots of petticoats. Got it, thank you. Um, was sewing done by hand and when did, the hand, when did the home sewing machine come into wider use? Great question. So yes, um, until about the 1870s, most women are sewing by hand. Um, women are for sure going to be sewing their children's clothes, their husband's shirts, and their own undergarments. Um, some women are going to sew their entire wardrobes. Other women who um, don't have the skill or the inclination and do have the financial means are going to hire a dressmaker to come help them out. And often a dressmaker was engaged for things like um, wedding dresses or nice outer dresses or dresses that required a really precise fit and a lot of skill to do. Um, so the home sewing machine gets widely marketed and makes its way into middle class homes by about the 1860s and 1870s, and it was supposed to save women time, and in some ways it did. Um, you might make a shirt now in an hour and a half rather than 14 hours. However, fashion responded by getting a whole lot more complicated. So if you look at clothes from the 1870s, they are very frilly and roughly and there's pleats and bows and lace and ruching and anything you can put on a garment and the idea is like well you've got a sewing machine now you are saving all that time so you have time to do it so the standards just kind of like bumped up that much more great thank you um so another question is why were white garments easier to launder for in infants but impractical impracticable for brides? Is it the fabric type or the amount? Yes, it goes back to fabric. Um, so your infants are going to be in um, muslin and cotton and sometimes wool flannel, which are pretty durable. Your wedding dresses, if they're nice, are going to be um, usually a silk. Um, um, I think sometimes you might get away with a wool dress, but if, if you're a wealthy bride, um, it's typically going to be a silk dress, and that's not something that's going to launder easily. So yeah, it does come down to the fabric. And the next question is from an eight-year-old in our audience. Cool. Um, would, would an eight-year-old make all of their own clothes? 
Um, they would help. Um, your mom might give you um, jobs like hemming or sewing straight seams. And these are skills that you would have been doing for about four years by then. So you'd be pretty good at it. Your mom would probably either do the trickier stuff like making buttonholes or making the arms fit well. She would either do that herself or she would bring in a dressmaker to do that. And oftentimes your clothes are going to be clothes that started out as your mom's or maybe an older sister's. And when they wore places out and couldn't wear it anymore, they would take it apart, cut up all the fabric and then re-piece it together for you. So great question. Great. Um, what were typical co um, colors for young women's dresses? Were they bright, common? Um, the person who's asking said they always kind of pictured it being more the matron look, but your presentation made them think something different. Yeah, it's um, young women could wear bright colors. Um, older women could wear jewel tones. So yeah, there is sort of like a kind of some fudge room about who could wear what. Um, yeah, so young women could either wear bright colors or the advice manual is really like pushing like pastels and soft colors as well too for younger women. Okay. And how many dresses did an average woman own? That is also a great question and it's hard to tell. It's um, it varies a lot by your, you know, financial means. Um, a poor woman might have a dress for church and the other dress that she wears the rest of the week. So have two garments. Um, your Mary Lincoln, when she became first lady, hired Elizabeth Keckley to make her 16 dresses within the first year. So that's at the upper end of things. Um, a typical middle-class woman would probably own about 10 garments. And I actually just saw a reference to this. Um, it was advised that she have, and I forgot the breakdown of it, but it was like, two morning dresses, two day dresses, two evening dresses, a traveling dress, and a couple others. So I would say probably about like six to 10 for an average woman. Um, people had far fewer clothes than we do today and they invested a lot more time in them. So um, mending is you know, a constant practice. You're always trying to keep your garments fresh. Um, if things wear out, you might, as I mentioned with the kids clothes, you might, break it all apart and rearrange it and put it back together. Or if it's out of style, you might add a ribbon or kind of freshen up the cut or the trim on it a little bit. So here's a question um, regarding the change in women being out more active outdoors. Was the change after the Civil War of women being more active and being outdoors a result of the amount of men lost in the Civil War, allowing them that freedom or maybe women feeling more independent, or did this cultural shift happen organically outside of the Civil War? That is a really good question, and I don't know that I know the answer to it. Um, my sense is that the Civil War had to have something to do with it because it was just such a, you know, all-encompassing, impactful event that I don't think you can imagine life without it, you know, without that. And I think the idea that perhaps because men were gone and women were taking on different roles, um, that makes a lot of sense to me. And so I would argue probably, yeah, you know, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to put the toothpaste back in the tube. If you've been running the house or running the farm or running the business, um, then, you know, this idea that you're a kind of frail um, flower has shattered and you've proved yourself. And so, yeah, might as well, embrace a wider role. Thanks, Erica. We still have a few more. Um, so was it shame to not be married for women and were servants living in the home or did they get paid? Um, <clears throat> it's, let me see. There were unmarried women. Um, I don't get a sense of whether it was a source of shame. And, you know, probably 
once a woman, you know, if you got married and you hit that crash of like, oh my gosh, I'm in charge of this household, there might almost be a sense of envy about it. Um, that's not to say most women weren't like, they weren't living in apartments or, you know, living a single life. Most unmarried women were living with um, parents or a brother or um, another relative, but they weren't, they didn't have all that housekeeper responsibility. Um, as to domestic servants, um, let's see, they typically lived within the home. Um, in rural settings, they were considered more um, hired help, which is they would they would come stay for a few weeks at a time, or you know they might actually be day laborers who went back to their own house back and forth. And the kind of class distinction between you know employer and servant wasn't as distinct. A hired helper was considered kind of socially more on par and more free to kind of come and go. Um, it turned into more of a servant in the later 19th century, and a lot of these roles were filled by immigrant women, um, Irish women, German women, Scandinavian women, and they were treated much more as like the help or, you know, the servant within the home, um, sort of a secondary status, who were meant to live on site. They did work for wages. Um, and so, you know, with room and board included, a lot of um, immigrant women were able to save up money um, and send it home to family that was uh, still back in their old country. Um, sometimes they would buy really nice clothes and their employers would get annoyed because they're supposed to be the servant and they're walking around in this wonderful silk dress that they um, earned and had made for themselves. Okay. And Eric, I'm gonna kind of group a couple of these together on this because they kind of seem to be in the same area. Um, did women have different wardrobes per season and would they share different dresses with other people over a period of time? Um, there were definitely different wardrobes for seasons. Um, there tended to be more like cotton and muslin for warm weather, and then you break out your wools for the winter, and there's instructions of how to like hold up your wool and put it in a trunk um, and put it away for the season. Um, I'm sorry, remind me of the second question. Oh, did they share garments with other yes. women? Um, not typically, um, because women's clothing was all, um, it was all bespoke. It was made and cut and measured to a woman's specific figure. Um, and so unless you had, you know, the exact bust measurements and waist measurements of another woman, it's going to be hard to get, um, a proper fit. There was probably, you know, if you were similar in size, you might be able to share back and forth. But what's more common is garments passing down from members of the household, but there would be like significant alteration in between that, like cutting things apart and remaking something from the same fabric for another person. Thank you. How much would a dress, including uh, undergarments, cost for working class woman at the time? Oh boy, um, I don't know that I know that off the top of my head. Um, I can tell you that there's a huge variety of fabrics available. Um, this is the age of mass produced textiles. So there are domestic um, calico cotton being produced. Um, England is shipping over um, wool and silk. So you could really find um, fabric to suit every budget. Um, Silk is going to be the most expensive, although the price comes down um, later in the 19th century when there's silk factories um, kind of getting going in the United States as well. So I don't know um, like a, a dollar figure or even a proportion of an income. Um, I do know that uh, there were nicer quality fabrics um, that might not be apparent to our eye, but I think to a 19th century eye, you would be able to look at someone and tell an expensive dress by the quality of their fabric, and also kind of by the amount of trim on it and the, the quality of the fit as well. Thank you, Erica. And related to that, um, where did women get their fabric and their trims 
during the day and um, why were certain colors like white more expensive? Um, so women uh, kind of depends on where you live. If you are a rural woman, you might have a country store um, that's going to stock like calicos and maybe some wools, and you might get your dress goods there and you're literally buying like yardage. Um, <clears throat> the bigger metropolitan centers just like today are going to have better um, better selection. So I've seen in a lot of letters from Springfield women where they will go to Chicago or they will go to St. Louis um, to look for their dress goods and especially for like ribbons and trim and things like that. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second question? Why were certain certain colors more expensive than others like white? White was expensive because um, it was hard to like get it all white. You had to like bleach it and get it to such a degree where it was like even all over and like a pure creamy, you know, white that's not going to get soiled anywhere along the production chain. Um, in terms of other colors, I don't know the like, you know, chemical composition. I do know that there are advances in the production of synthetic dyes throughout the 19th century. Um, I don't know if it factored into the cost, but it definitely factored into the popularity. Um, like that real acid colored green became very popular because it was developed in the mid 19th century. It was actually based off of arsenic. So it was um, hazardous to your health. Um, the synthetic, Purple was developed in 1856 on accident, but um, there's a craze in the late 1850s after that for having purple clothing because that's something that, you know, was difficult to achieve through vegetable dyes prior. And now you get this like really rich, vibrant, beautiful purple that's available out of a bottle. Great, thank you. Um, Erica, I'll take just a couple of more questions. We still got quite a few in there. Um, what would happen if you didn't follow guidelines and magazines? Would you be locked down in a social setting or what might happen? Um, so the way it worked was people are reading Godey's magazine and Peterson's magazine pretty religiously. And these are coming from Paris, like the, the fashions are coming out of Paris, the American magazine publishers are copying them because copyright is a little bit looser than and redistributing them to American homes. And so what these American women are seeing in the fashion magazines are the ideal. It's like the dress with all the bells and whistles. And what seems to be happening is that women look at these magazines and they're like, huh, okay, sleeves are tighter this year, or like, okay, they're putting bows on the shoulders. And so they're going to take their dress and incorporate changes to the you know trim or to the cut a little bit but generally they're not going to like embrace the full-on you know magazine version of that the degree to which they follow it um sort of depends um there's leeway given for you know people understand what people's like social and financial situations are and you're sort of meant to like dress accordingly um, it's also, if you are well-bred, you're not supposed to remark on any eccentricities in others. So um, you would probably be silently judged. Um, however, if you're wearing something that's like totally off the wall, um, you know, I have actually read about a woman who was uh, committed to an asylum for wearing clothes, the wrong clothes in the wrong season. So, um, you know, this again is a time when women don't have a whole lot of agency. Um, we just had a wonderful presentation by Kate Moore, who authored a biography of a woman named Elizabeth Packard, whose husband committed her to an insane asylum because he didn't like the way she thought or what she said. Um, but these are like extreme cases. Um, I would say mainly if you're not dressing quote unquote appropriately, you would be judged silently. Thank you, Erica. And, there, and there's just two last ones I'm going to ask that are in the questions and then um, I'll put your email in the chat also so that people can email you directly for the rest of them. We've got quite a bunch still. But um, would you say that uh, your presentation is geared mostly towards Northern, specifically Illinois women? Um, would Southern dress customs be different? And then kind of in that same 
genre of talking about North and South, in some Civil War reenactment groups, it's held that calico was for slaves only, not generally used for whites. Do you find that to be true? Um, yes, I would say I do have a Northern bias being from Illinois and working at the Illinois State Museum. I tend to look at everything through a Illinois lens. So I would say that's sort of my default. I wouldn't necessarily presume that everything I say um, is, you know, carries over to the South, um, especially during the Civil War. The, there was huge disruptions in the supply chain. So Southern ladies had to really embrace homespun again in a way that Northern women didn't. Um, in the North, um, Calico was, women in rural settings wore it. Um, in fact, you get a time when women are still producing, um, they're still spinning and producing yarn, sometimes even homespun cloth on their farms, and they're taking it to the um, corner store and they are trading it in for calico cloth to make dresses because they think the calico is prettier. Um, there's a lot of revolutions in printing techniques that leads to a wide array of patterns and colors that people are just kind of enchanted with. Um, also, women like work, you know, um, whether you are a well to do woman or um, a woman of very limited means, um, all women had periods of intense labor. And so a calico dress, um, they tend to be a lot more washable, especially a dark color and especially a figured print. Um, the dark was thought to hide stains better and a figured print was a little bit more, or like a small print was more forgiving of like blending stains. And if you got a big spot, you might, you know, put a patch on it or cut it apart and remake it. So I would say that most women probably did have a good sturdy calico dress um, for their housework or farm work or outdoor work or whatever. Thank you, Erica. And I wanna take this opportunity to thank you all for attending tonight's program. We hope to see you in the future at museum programs and events. Check out the museum's website to see all of our upcoming events.